We are the OABS capstone team. So what's our project about and why should you care? The internal combustion engine of the crankcase of the internal combustion engine is a very hot and violent place. You have uh, you have combustion gases slipping past the piston rings containing hydrocarbons. You also have the crankshaft and connecting rod shearing oil droplets into a mist. The combination of the two create positive crankcase pressure. You need to relieve this pressure in order pr to promote piston ring seal and overall engine seal. The original design to deal with this was the road draft tube. This road draft tube emitted the oil and air and hydrocarbons to the atmosphere, bad for the environment. In 1963, a GM engineer came up with a PCB system, this diagram on the left is actually the one from that, which re-put re the oil and air and hydrocarbons into the intake. Great for the hydrocarbons because they get reburned, good for the environment. The problem is the oil that comes along with it contains cetane, and the amount of cetane added to the air fuel mixture lowers the octane, which then lowers the performance of the economy. This is where the OABS system is important because the OABS system will drop the oil out of the air and oil and hydrocarbon mix, allowing the hydrocarbons to go on, get reburned, the oil to stay out so that the fuel mixture stays uncompromised, and also the intake track will stay clean. So you can see this picture here, this is what happens when the oil goes in there. And uh, so it's good for the environment, good for performance, good for economy. Project's broken down into four main phases. Phase one, we do project initiation and planning. And this is also where we start to design and manufacture our data acquisition system. Uh, phase two gets into concept development, and we start to take the information we got from phase one to, to design our flow bench. Uh, phase three, we start to develop our functional prototype, uh, doing the design phases, and also testing uh, other manufacturers' catch cans. And then phase four was the production and warranty of our prototype. Part of phase one, we had to come up with a plan. To do this, we decided to make a VN chart because it helps us lay everything out, see what we have to do. Also, we can update it in real time, see where we are, see what we need to do, and whatnot. Also, it helps with accountability so we can stay on top of each other so we can see who's doing what and when it's due. Uh, part of phase one is building our data acquisition system. So, we knew that we needed to be able to measure the PCB airflow rate. Right? So, to do that, we got our Honeywell airflow sensor, um, which allows us to measure 0 to 7 CFM of flow. Uh, we also needed pressure sensors, so we actually used just general GM one bar map sensors. And all of those uh, sensors were connected to our data acquisition system uh, by means of a wiring harness here. And we also had uh, an inductive RPM pickup, which allowed us to relate that airflow back to a given engine load. And everything, all that uh, sensor data comes into our Innovate DL32 data acquisition system, and then it's connected to our laptop so that we can, we can do uh, graphical analysis. Uh, one of the problems that we encountered during phase one was that uh, we realized our flow sensor needed a 10 volt power supply and we only had 12 volts readily available on the DAC. So we knew that we needed to make a simple voltage regulator circuit. So we first proved it out on a breadboard and then we actually used off the shelf components from Radio Shack to build a functional prototype. And then we decided that we wanted more compact design, something that was going to be more reliable from test to test. So we actually made a custom printed circuit board design, uh, which you can see over on the right. Mock flow bench, fail fast, fail cheap. Once we actually had come up with our data acquisition system, we had all the key components that we needed to use on our flow bench, we decided we wanted to use a compressed air source power bench. Before we spent all the time and money building the bench, we needed to prove the concept. So as you can see in these pictures here, we have our compressed air source, all the components from the data acquisition system, and our laptop, and we were able to prove that we were able to get the desired 0 to 7 CFM. And once we had proof of concept, we were able to move on to designing our flow bench. Once we had proven the concept that we could use a compressed air source, we had to fit that into a bench. Uh, we wanted to recreate 0 to 7 CFM. We wanted to have the options for onboard air or plug in the shop air. We also wanted it to be mobile and like, fit into doorways and such so we could go anywhere there's power, we could run tests. Once we had a completed design and a completed manufacturing print package, we could start building. Using our bill of materials and our cutlets from our manufacturing print package, we can start fabrication. In the upper left, you can see we started with a solid foundation, the bottom of our frame, and underneath on the carpet, you can see all the other cut tubes where we're able to get it all set. In the center of the top, you can see it's fully welded, polished, that was a little bit extra. In the top right, you can see we started adding our wood panels and our custom uh, bench top, which has every one of our sponsors inscribed into it. In the lower left, you can see all the components are starting to come together. And one of the key aspects of this is we're 
testing in real time. Once we got something done, we tried it out to make sure it was going to work. A really good example of this is our oil injection system. The original system we designed for just wasn't going to work. We knew it wasn't. So we had to redesign midstream. We made our manufacturing pin package reflect that. And this is a picture of us testing it, and it worked. Another part of phase two is to develop a test standard once we had our bench. It's not just good enough to have a bench there. We have to have a, a standard to test these catch cans by. <coughs> Currently, uh, the catch cans might be tested in the within house manufacturing, so you might have the test within catch can company A, and you might have the test within catch can company B. We don't have any guarantee that the test between those companies are the same exact thing. So what we did here, this is a sample of what we developed as a test, uh, was something that would be fair and uh, that we could use on all the catch cans across the board. That way we can determine which catch cans are actually the best ones out there. At this point, we began to benchmark current catch cans that are on the market. Uh, first, we want to figure out what size are they, what typical fittings do they use. Also, probably most importantly, what their filter media is, if any. And then later on, we actually do some performance benchmarking using the standard that Matt just talked about. Now we kind of compare everything together. Once again, another part of phase two was to uh, research different methods of removing oil from uh, your air system. A lot of the catch cans we had uh, used an impingement system. We decided we want to go with something a little bit different for our final design. We went with a, a cyclonic action system, which induces the air tangentially into the chamber. As you can see behind me, we have an animated GIF that we found. Um, the oil particles will be represented by the yellow particles here. And due to the high velocity coming in and the momentum, they get thrown to the outside of the uh, the oil chamber, or the cyclone chamber, and drip down into the catch. Meanwhile, there's a low pressure zone created by the cyclone. It allows the cleaned air to shoot back up through the inlet at the top, back into your uh, inlet to your engine, and burns cleaner than before. Um, currently, how we test, test catch cans, we start off, we charge the compressor right off the bat, and then we actually weigh uh, both the oil reservoir when it's full and the catch can when it's empty. And then we pick a desired flow rate, say 4 CFM, and we adjust our air regulator here until we can achieve that flow. Once we have that flow set up, we start the test by starting to take data, and then we turn on the oil injection system. Once the test runs for about 10 minutes, we stop the test, and then we reweigh the oil reservoir and the catch can to determine what the efficiency was. So how much oil was in injected versus how much was actually collected. And that tells us our efficiency range. And at the same time, we're also doing a differential pressure test to determine what kind of restriction this system adds on the entire engine. Uh, phase four is the final design. As I mentioned before, we look at the cyclonic action, as you can uh, see that's represented here in the cross section. One of the good things about this design is after the uh, after our can down at the bottom is filled up, uh, to a certain point, the cyclone will no longer be induced. That allows your air to go back through your system. You might think that's a bad thing based off of what Forrest told you at the beginning of our presentation, but we found that catch cans have a tendency of, once they fill up, to send slugs of oil back through your system, which isn't good for it. So this can design won't do that as long as you don't let it fill all the way up to the top. All right. <laughs> I was also in charge of the web presence for our, uh, our project. Part of the GMT capstone requirements are that every team maintain a website, which uh, we have represented by the screenshot over here on my right your left. Uh, we also decided we wanted to do a separate blog that anyone who wanted to follow us could follow that. We tried to update it uh, weekly and at large milestones that um, we made. Uh, it allowed us to have a little bit more free time with, uh, or a little bit more leeway with the design uh, background. And we can put a slideshow on there so you can see all of our uh, project photos that we've used throughout the whole semester. Um, this would also upload to our social media website. We've got a, a Google Plus. So as soon as we post a blog here, anyone who's following us on Google Plus, as you can see Dan did, <laughs> uh, he, all of our followers will be updated on what we've been doing. And uh, our website actually has everything that we've talked about here in this project in greater detail. There's a lot that we did that we couldn't really cover here. There's a lot more on the history. And uh, one of the biggest things is our Sponsors. We'd like to thank our sponsors for without them, none of this would be possible. We'd also like to throw out special thanks to the College of Engineering, School of Engineering Technology, and Advanced Manufacturing Center. Any questions? Um, I know you guys can't get into specifics based on manufacturing these cans, but in general, um, based on the types of cans that you guys tested, which ones performed better? Like, what kind of media uh, entrapment worked best? That really depends on which uh, 
which catch can you're talking about. I mean, we have the Cyclonic Action one we have. Uh, the Cyclone is actually designed for a specific CFM. So it works very, very well at that given CFM. At uh, higher CFMs, it doesn't work so well because it's not designed to work at that level. Um, and then, ours, yeah, go ahead. And out of the cans we have, we, we had some that performed very well over the broad range, and then some that were very good at one part, and then, you know, kind of mediocre or comparable to the others at other places. So it is really definitive on what, what CFM. So it was very... So certain cans would actually work better with certain cars. Yes. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yes. 